when we compare the Buddha's teachings to other teachings of his time, what's really striking is his focus. Other people started with descriptions of the world. This is the nature of the world, they say. It's eternal, not eternal, finite, infinite. Or this is the nature of the soul or the self, eternal, not eternal, finite, infinite. He started with the path of practice, a noble eightfold path, which he said would generate knowledge and vision, would lead to peace, direct knowledge, self-awakening, unbinding. The emphasis from the very beginning was practical, a course of action, a course of training that would lead to results. So think about that as we practice. We're here doing the training. This is the, the heart of the teaching. This is the central focus of the teaching. So pay a lot of attention right here. And think about what the Buddha had to say about what you're going to find right here. He started his path with right view, and right view, of course, is the Four Noble Truths, focused on the issue of stress, suffering. Dukkha is the Pali term. In its ordinary, everyday meaning, dukkha means pain. Sometimes you hear it described etymologically. Du means bad. Ta can mean either the hub of a wheel or space. The idea being, in the first case, that it's like a hub that hasn't been properly fixed on its axle. As you ride along, it's uncomfortable. The second one is explained that the mind is in a bad space. But the Buddha never used images like that. For him, dukkha was like a fire that burns away at the heart. It's like a precipice. You fall down there and you can get badly hurt. It's like the darkness between galaxies. It can get you totally lost. But, he says, if you comprehend it, you can put an end to it. That's the duty with regard to the First Noble Truth. And the First Noble Truth defines dukkha, first with examples. There's the dukkha of birth, aging, death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, distress, and despair. It covers both physical pain and mental pain, and the pain that comes with birth, aging, and death. But then he gives a synopsis. Which is not nearly as direct, or it doesn't seem to be as direct as the as the examples. And the examples are things that everybody knows. But then he gets technical. The five clinging aggregates. And the important word there is the clinging. Because there are places where he says the aggregates on their own are experienced by arhats. They have form, feeling, feelings, perceptions, thought fabrications, consciousness, but they don't suffer. because they don't have the clinging. So the First Noble Truth, to comprehend it, you have to comprehend it as clinging, when every time you suffer, every time there's a weight on the mind, a fire burning in the mind, darkness in the mind, it's clinging. That's what's burning. That's what's dark. So we're trying to put an end to the fire, trying to bring some light to the darkness by looking at the kinds of clinging and also understanding the craving that causes that clinging, because the craving is the second noble truth. And part of comprehending the suffering is to see where it comes from, because sometimes you hear the word dukkha translated as dissatisfaction or unsatisfactoriness, 
which is not a very satisfactory translation, because it makes it sound like if you could allow yourself to be satisfied with things as they are, there would be no problem. And that's somehow, sometimes how the cause of suffering is defined, wanting things to be other than what they are, which carries the implication that if you could learn some patience and some equanimity, some endurance, some acceptance, there wouldn't be any suffering. But the Buddha's teaching goes a lot more deeply than that. Suffering comes, he says, from three kinds of craving. Craving for sensuality, in other words, your fascination with thinking about sensual pleasures, sex being number one, food being actually number one, sex being number two. And the Buddha was wise to see that even when your fantasies go as you would like, there's still stress, there's still suffering. The second kind of craving is craving for becoming, wanting to take on an identity in a particular world of experience, which can happen on the micro level as you think about things you want and then who you are as the person who could gain those things and enjoy those things. And then the world in which those things are found, or the parts of the world that are relevant to those things. All of that is a becoming. Those becomings happen in the mind all the time. And again, your thoughts of becoming in, in the mind could go precisely as you want them to, but they're still going to be stressed. They're still suffering. Craving for non-becoming, that's the third kind of craving. When you have an identity in a particular world, and you don't like it, you want to see it abolished, you want to see it annihilated. And even if it were annihilated, you still suffer. Because in all those cases, from the craving comes clinging. There's clinging for sensuality, clinging at views, views about the world, views about the self. In other words, views related to becoming. Clinging to habits and practices, you have a particular idea of how things should be done, and you hold to it regardless of whether it really gets good results or not. And then clinging to ideas of the self, ways of defining yourself. Those four kinds of clinging then get focused on the aggregates, the aggregates of physical form, feeling, perception. Fabrication, consciousness. When you can see your suffering in those terms, that's when you comprehend it. Now to see it requires good powers of concentration, together with right view, which is why you have to develop the path. And concentration requires virtue to be honest concentration. Mindfulness and alertness so that you can watch what's happening in the present moment. So it's in this way that the duties of the Four Noble Truths all come together, because when the path is fully developed, that's when you complete the duty for the Third Noble Truth, which is dispassion for the craving, which is something to be, to be realized. So this is the framework for understanding what we're doing here. And you notice, if you look at the mind while you're practicing right concentration, you're actually using some of those forms of clinging, not clinging to sensuality. That's the clinging you put aside. But you have some views, the right views. You have some ideas about habits and practices how to get the mind to settle down. And you have at least an idea of yourself as being competent to do this, and that you'll benefit from this. It's not a full-blown <coughs> full blown doctrine of the self, but it is a sense of the self that you're going to need. So what you're doing is you're taking part of what is suffering. And you're turning it into the path. 
And as many people have said, the things you know best are the things you do. And so you're going to be watching yourself as you do the path, develop the path. Because right there you're going to really see the aggregates clearly, and you're going to get to see your clinging clearly. First you'll be looking for the clingings that get in the way of getting the mind to settle down. And it's good to learn how to step back from them and, and name them, whether they're sensuality, or a view about the world, or a view about yourself, or, what, or a view about what you should be doing now instead of practicing. Learn to see those things, those things as, as the suffering. As John Swart would say, anything that disturbs your concentration, chalk up to suffering. If it's not suffering, then it's going to be the craving, one of the two. That's something that you want to comprehend, and if it's craving, then you let it go. But learn to see things in these terms. This is why the Buddha starts the path with right view. He's giving you a framework. Change the way you look at your suffering. It's not enough to say simply, well, I, I see that there is suffering, and simply witness the pain, witness the anguish. Try to apply the framework. Which aggregate are you clinging to? What kind of clinging are you using? When you see that, you really begin to comprehend the suffering. And it's the things that interfere with the concentration get cleared away. Then you're turning to look at the concentration itself. It's made up of these things. There's some views in there. There's some habits and practices in there. There's a sense of self in there. Start taking that apart. It's like painting yourself into a corner. You've painted the whole floor. And all that's left is that little spot where you're standing. And what you've got to do is destroy the walls. Or ask yourself if the walls really are there. You've assumed the walls are there up to that point. But there comes a point where you see that the walls were an assumption. That you don't have to assume. So you can complete the job and be free. That's what the Buddha promises. So whenever there's any suffering in the mind, ask yourself, can I look at it in these terms? The Buddha is lending us some of his, his insights. In the very beginning, it's not clearly so. All too often you hear that the Four Noble Truths are not beliefs, they're simply statements of fact. They're not beliefs, they're simply statements of fact. But in the very beginning you have to believe them. You believe the framework so you can apply it to see if it works. It's not just a floating belief. It's a working hypothesis. But you have to be clear about the fact that you're still learning about the framework. The more you apply it, the more you're going to understand it. And the more you see how beneficial it is. That's how you go from conviction to knowledge. From feeling your way around the problem of suffering to actually comprehending it.